Hi Jürgen, welcome to the Future Proof Operations Podcast. Hi Benjamin, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, thank you very much for your invitation. Jürgen, could you give me a 60 seconds overview of who you are and what you are doing? Sure, with pleasure. Um, yeah, I've been a member of uh, Travit's uh, Industry Expert Advisory Board since uh, four year, for four years now. And since, since uh, February this year, um, I've been a member of uh, Travit's Executive Board as a Chief Growth Officer. Um, prior to that, I was an entrepreneur and management consultant. And uh, for more than 10 years, um, quite a long time, and mainly in the area of business process reengineering for manufacturing companies as well as the turnaround sector. And uh, for the last 10 years, I was a member of uh, various executive boards at um, yeah, mainly uh, software tech companies um, as executive board member, or respectively uh, CEO or uh, chief commercial officer. Um, responsible for corporate development strategy, growth, and internationalization. Um, from a profession, professional background, um, I'm an engineer by profession uh, for communication precision, precision engineering. And um, yeah, at the, at the end of the day, I'm uh, passionate about technology, cars, and the latest software development trends, um, especially in the field of AI, which is uh, literally catapults humanity into new areas. Jürgen, you mentioned AI. Help us to understand which role does AI play nowadays in factories? Um, it depends, actually, from, from, from industry and, and, and also from, from most of the use cases. Um, so, um, actually, uh, according to the, the IBM Global AI Adoption Index, which was released in May this year, um, as of today, only 35% of the companies uh, globally reported the, the use of AI in their business. And um, of course, additionally, uh, 42% um, reported that they are exploring AI. So the good news is that the exploration and the adoption of AI is, of course, steadily growing, but we are still at the beginning. And um, and. Uh, there is also um, a trend in the adoption. So um, most of the use cases and the highest adoption rates um, are in the IT departments um, themselves. Um, since here, um, not only the use cases um, are um, mainly um, defined by repetitive and recurring tasks, uh, which can be automated, like network performance management, business process management, or IT operations, but also the knowledge is available. Um, but there's also for other industries a clear trend, but it's, it's also due to the macroeconomic changes that we can see at the moment, um, the climate change, energy changes, uh, conflicts or world supply chain issues, um, that 66% of the companies are either using um, the AI or planning to, to execute AI to address their so, so sustainability goals. So. Um, there is a trend uh, that more and more P uh, companies are, are trying to adopt um, AI, and um, but the focus is most of the cases in automating um, IT task or, or repetitive task. Um, but the good news is also that the more and more trends upcoming in the areas of uh, cost savings, energy savings, and efficiency increases. Um, in the industrial environment, to be honest, um, the adoption rate is not that high. So the mm -hmm. most AI ad applications um, are found in the automotive industry or assembling industry with, I think, an uh, uh, adoption rate of 26% in manufacturing. And of course, in the process industries like uh, CPG or uh, healthcare or uh, pharmaceuticals, um, for example, uh, optical quality control um, with a high frequency rate um, in, 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 in high productivity environments or uh, beverage filling lines um, in, the, in the food industry. Um, so that are, that are um, the most frequently used um, um, use cases. And of course, in many mechanical and plant engineering, you see also the adoption of predictive maintenance mm -hmm. uh, quite common. And um, an AI is there used for increase of OEE. But mm -hmm. in, as I said, um, in general, we, we're at the beginning of the adoption of AI. Um, the reluctance and resistance is still very high in, in, in some cases, as there are hardly any, any 
ready to use um, products, AI products available yeah. in, in an average um, with a traditional AI project. Um, a project still takes between 18 and 24 months. So and which often entails costs in the millions. Um, when you talk about the specific use cases and industries, I know that your company Twaret is focusing on foundry these days. Are those companies innovative right. ones? Um, a few ones, yes. <laughs> the, uh, the, the topic here is that the process itself of, of casting is very complex. So um, the reluctance and resistance to believe that a technology can can um, be as equal good as a, a human um, expert with uh, 30, 40 years experience is quite high um, mm -hmm. because of the complexity of the process. You have to imagine that um, influencing factors, for example, on the quality could raise up to 30, 40 or 60 parameters um, depending on the business, pro uh, no, on the production processes. So that means um, we have trillions of combinations um, that can influence the quality so therefore the the not the, the missing knowledge about technology uh, like ai plus this complex um, production process leads to a situation where uh, most of the companies do not really think and believe that mm -hmm. uh, ai can solve or help them actually in which industries do you see the biggest progress in ai at the moment, um, definitely in the in automotive industry and, uh, and the um, uh, consumer goods um, industry, they are really um, driving the adoption of AI. Um, and we see that more and more use cases are also dripping into, in, into, into industries like, like also foundries or in general metal metal working industries like uh, um, picking assistance, um, picking guides or whatever, or quality assurance, for example. Um, so um, the topic in, in, in the industry is that um, the more focused and more precise the use case for an, an AI uh, application is, the, more, the better it is, and also the, um, the, the higher um, the acceptance and, and, and um, understanding of that um, application is guaranteed. Hmm. Jürgen, your vision is manufacturing with zero waste and full sustainability. How is that related to AI? Well, um, as I said, the, the, especially for the foundries in the industry, um, the, the industry is not, um, for many, many years, they were on a, on a point where they had a, a continuous improvement programs are running. So the, the industry was uh, facing all the years uh, cost pressures, mainly for uh, coming from the automotive industry, which which serves for eighty percent of their clients, and um, and so therefore the the pressure to be more efficient, be more cost um, um, efficient, to be uh, more um, stable also in terms of the process um, capabilities, um, leads to a continuous improvement of the of the production processes. But as I said, due to the complexity of the process there is still a, um, a missing gap of optimization potential, which could not be um, encountered and, and developed just with human expertise because of the complexity of the combination and varieties of the influencing factors. So um, there is a natural, let's say, level which could not um, be overstepped with human expertise by that we see the huge potential, especially in those industries where you have a very in energy intensive production like foundries or metalworking mm -hmm. um, to reduce really any kind of waste which still exists, which can be, which is untouched at the moment because of the uh, possibilities, the lacking possibilities. Um, and to, to drive a whole industry towards um, zero waste and, and complete sustainability by empowering and, 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 and unlocking the potentials which are untouched at the moment. Okay, understood. Help us to understand how a project at Twaret usually looks like. So if I would like to 
go to full sustainability. I would like to have zero waste. This is the vision from my point of view when I'm, for, for example, a factory um, boss and I am contacting you. Which steps do I have to go together with you to take the advantage of the technology like AI? So first of all, what we um, um, should mention at that point is that um, Travit is uh, one of the only provider that provides ready-to-use products. As I mentioned before, um, the traditional AI products are very complex and, and costly. Um, so um, we try to, to implement most of the domain-specific knowledge um, for vertical industries like uh, foundries, like microworking in the product. So um, we are able to, to ramp up um, an, an AI uh, solution in use case, for example, um, prescriptive maintenance or in terms of uh, OE increase or reduction of rejects or reduction of energy waste within two to three months. Um, that means, um, of course, we need an, an infrastructure um, that is able to provide us the according data. Um, that means we need to have a connectivity base, a data layer, um, in order to get all the, the parameter and data points from the machines and then the, the process lines. Um, but as, as long as we have that, um, we are um, able to, to train just a, a small set of data um, within three to four weeks and provide the first results within the next uh, four weeks of adoption. That is possible because we have implemented a lot of domain specific knowledge and production knowledge within specific uh, products, which are um, industry specific um, developed. So that means um, since you are talking point, about the since you are talking about data, so as I understand, if I want to work with AI, I need a lot of data initially. And help me to understand how you gather the data. If I am in a factory and there's no data gathering at all, do I need to buy software beforehand? Do I need to buy sensors beforehand? How is that process looking like? So what we do usually, we do an assessment um, beforehand with a, with a client. Uh, we come first of all from the process and the problem statement. So that means, for example, if we would to like to reduce the energy consum consumption per produced part, or we would like to reduce the, the scrap rate, um, the rejection rate, um, we're coming from that problem statement and evaluate the, the influencing factors on that certain process and parameter um, environment. So that means... Um, given on that parameter and influencing factors, we, de we evaluate the existing data um, at the client, at the plant, which are available or which can be extracted, meaning um, by connecting, for example, directly to the machine, we can also connect directly data that is at the moment not collected, but available. The third level is, of course, data which is not available at all, meaning there is no sensor hardware equipment installed. Therefore, we have partners um, along with us that supports very quickly the, the provisioning of, of additional hardware sensors and, of course, connectivity solutions like um, IoT layers or whatever in order to provide also a uh, further um, scale-out possibility on a plane-wide rollout. After we have provided the data connectivity... Okay, so we can have that um, rollout in a, in a very efficient way uh, on multiple machines and 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 uh, and uh, products. And how do the next steps look like? So, if you know AI a little bit, like I'm doing it, I know that you need the data, and then you have to train the models. Right. And with the trained models, you can then get the insights out of it. Um, do you have to train the models? together with your client or do you use your pre-built models and how do the takeaways or the insights look like afterwards? So first of all, um, what we have is uh, predefined and pre-trained models um, in our products. That's why we um, um, have for certain verticals or for different industries, um, dedicated products because of the inbuilt domain knowledge and, and the, the pre-trained models. 
Um, that's also the reason why we are creating results within two to three months. Um, so the training um, effort is extremely low. Um, as I said, between three to four weeks, depending on the process. Um, and of course, of the, the uh, production volume, we need, of course, something between 3,000 and 5,000 parts in this duration. Um, so not a, not a mm -hmm. huge amount, um, uh, talking not about huge millions of data sets, but um, we need, of course, a certain amount of, of data. Um, and then um, the model is, of course, self-learning and adjusting um, over a period of time. So the longer the client is using the algorithm, the, the more precise it gets. Um, but we have also um, a specific patent, um, which is unique to to, to Chwabrit, um, that is called hybrid AI. And um, by that, um, we combine physical simulation with AI, which is very unique and, and, and as I said, patented from, from our side, uh, in order to eliminate the lack of data points. Um, because you cannot, you cannot measure, for example, certification in a melted, uh, in by a melted cast. Um, so you mm -hmm. need um, a different, different um, data points um, and different um, information source um, for including that physical behavior in production environments. And that's why we combine physical simulation and calculation and enrich our data models. Uh, with that physical simulation and overcome the, by that the lack of data, which are, of course are not present. Okay. So let's switch to the insights which you, which you are gathering for the clients. I assume, especially in times of high cost of energy nowadays, the return on investment is pretty clear. But what typical effects do your clients realize? And follow up question. What is the investment to achieve that? So what they realize is, um, is the, first of all, um, they start to try to implement energy management at all. Um, but they realize that an over, overall energy management over the plan is not sufficient at the moment um, because we're talking about such a pressure on reducing energy, um, which is which was never were not were never um, the case in in, in history uh, so far. So um, mm -hmm. the the companies are really um, not aware of the details that or also the information benefits that they gain out of the data uh, which we extract in in the overall the whole process um, chain. And um, so the the first um, yeah effect that they recognize is that actually they see um, a lot of optimization portals. For example, I give you um, an example, idle time of machines. Mm -hmm. Everybody is aware of, of, of idling the machines, but how much energy yeah. is really wasted by idling machines? Nobody can really um, calculate it or can have a, have a glue about it, actually. So um, by having a whole transparency about every waste of energy that occurs within the production um, process is getting a huge potential of energy savings. For example, in some cases, we achieve 30% of energy reduction just in, in the first three months. Um, so that Crazy. gives you a glimpse of, of that potential that is untouched at the moment, mainly because of the lack of visibility and transparency. What is the investment looking like? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, so we charge, we charge, uh, 1200 euros, um, as a SAS fee. Um, and that's the whole investment for the first machine. And if we go on a scale up, um, then we charge, um, additional 800 euros for the next machine and 400 for, uh, on the same machine, another product, um, in order to be very scalable. Uh, because uh, we can provide that very efficient uh, pricing um, because we do not have to reinvent all the, the algorithms um, and, and AI models uh, by machine by and, and machine um, um, because we have in, developed a technology it's called transfer learning that is able to just, let's say, copy and paste um, the models to different machines and different products or geometries. 
um, that enables, enables a very fish efficient uh, scaling with a, a third of the time and the, the, the data. Um, so basically, it's a it's a SaaS model which comes with very very clear um, model of of pricing per machine and product. Jürgen, as a Twaret customer, how long does it usually take to get the investment back? An average uh, less than six months. Um, so depending on, uh, of course, um, the use case, so the problem statement we're talking about, um, and accordingly also the investment that is needed in terms of, as we discussed, the missing data points. Um, so hardware, um, equipment, all this stuff. But we we've, we've never seen an in in, in an ROI um, that was uh, uh, longer than one year. Um, so uh, usually, in average, we have uh, six months of, of ROI. This is a very good number. Since you talked already about the example case, could you give us another case study, another example case where the whole implementation worked pretty well? And could you let, uh, could you describe it in a little more detail? So. Um, especially when it comes about the the savings and yeah the the cost. So yeah, um, maybe maybe some example from the the energy environment. Um, we had a, a, a huge um, we have a huge client um, in the area of um, of uh, low pressure die casting, um, and at what one plant um, we started to have um, the energy um, reduction project in October. Um, we started to implement it also some more energy meters um, because of the, as I said, missing capabilities on machine level to, to really measure the, um, the energy or the, 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 um, the consumption of energy power current um, on machine level. They usually what clients have is uh, energy management in best cases on plant level. So the investment there was um, besides the connectivity um, area um, in into energy meters. Um, we're talking about uh, uh, not not even 200k of investment, um, and uh, we were um, establishing the connection in within uh, two weeks um, to the first production line. It was a costing line, and uh, this costing line was responsible for almost a fourth um, of the whole um, energy consumption of the whole production line. Um, and um, the first um, analysis showed a very huge um, deviation of energy consumption per cost of product. Um, mm -hmm. That means, uh, especially when you cost, you have a, a heater uh, where the melted uh, metal um, is is uh, maintained in the in the in the temperature window, and um, the um, the given maximum power consumption of the heater was uh, 35 kilowatt. Um, but we observed that um, actually the heater was going up on, up to 42, 43 um, kilowatt. So over the 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 standard um, um, consumption of of energy. So. Um, There was obviously um, a an, an, an problem with the, the, the controller um, of the heater. Um, and furthermore, what we observed is that um, the current within the heater element was um, extremely high and, and fluctuation. So there, the, there was an observation that this heat element was corrupt and, and damaged. And um, so the, there was a, a, a huge loss of, of current um, and power in the heater element. Um, the data points that we used were, um, I think, just on that cost line, 80 data points per uh, machine. And um, so in total, um, um, I think uh, 800 to 1,000 data points per second uh, that, we, uh, that we gathered in Crazy. the technology. And, um, and there was also some, some um, yeah, information about, for example, the cooling, um, because we measure the flow of the air that is used to, to cool um, the mold. Um, and we observed that there's a fluctuation of, of air a leakage um, mm -hmm. over a huge amount. 
So in total, we um, our prescriptions, um, and, and by the way, this is a differentiation also, um, we do not only identify the reasons or the, the, um, the areas of improvements and predict them, um, we also prescribe countermeasures or um, parameter set points um, that leads to an optimum um, operation or leads to a, redu a reduction of the, of the waste um, that occurs, for example, the leakage. So we identified, for example, the area of the leakage um, because of the different sensor uh, and, 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 and flow sensors that we that we are able to uh, integrate it. Um, and we prescribe the, the countermeasures, uh, for example, also for the heater control, um, that there must be a, a, a wrong or damaged control on the heater. Um, so we give the, 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 the workers precise information, what to do, where to look after and, and how to fix the, um, the, the missing or the, the, the leakage or the, uh, the errors that, uh, occur, that we identified. And by that, we achieved in the first uh, two months, 17% um, of, of energy reduction. And in the second iteration, two months later, another 12%. Um, so in, in total, or 13%. So in roughly 30% um, energy reduction in uh, three months. That are very, very good numbers. And you already talked about workers. And I find that a great segue to focus on the workers and the people in the businesses a little bit more. My first question is going in the direction of the people which are working in a company um, that is implementing your technology. And I understood that AI is one of the core technologies leveraging everything you will set basically. How important is it for companies to build internal AI capabilities? So how important is it to have knowledge about AI internally as well, even if you are supporting them as a consultant or with your software? Um, in our case, it is not necessary to, to build um, in-house AI um, knowledge. First of all, it's it's very difficult to find um, appropriate AI skills or to even build up intelligence about this technology in-house. Um, but even more, um, what we try to do is to abstract the, the technology. So it's it's not important if mm -hmm. the the core technology is AI or deep learning. It's it's not relevant. The relevant factor is that we create values that we create a benefit for the workers, that we create a, a values for the company and that the technology is serving the people, the humans. That means mm -hmm. um, we, we need to set, of course, a technology into place that is capable to, to, to deliver those results and then create a, those values. But it doesn't matter at the end of the day if it's a, a software that is uh, coded or is it uh, a software that is uh, based on AI or whatever technology. Um, mm -hmm. So what we try to do is to abstract the technology layer and to provide an easy to use tool that is also from a, from a UI perspective um, optimized to the workers. So a, a workers or um, a shop floor centric UI that is also not um, increasing the barriers of, of acceptance, but lowering more the, the use of, of the, such a technology because the workers do not have the, the resistance in order to have a complicated software. They feel comfortable with it and they see the results. So the acceptance and adoption rate increases by um, make it easy, comfortable and um, very intuitive. Mm -hmm. So you say the IT department, for example, does not need to have AI cap capabilities. You have yes. that capabilities and you bring it in. Then you already mentioned the workers in the shop floor. So let's talk about them. In our preparation call in front of the podcast, we had already in a conversation about AI and worker empowerment. And you said worker empowerment 
is not doable or let's say it again you said ai on the shop floor can't work without worker empowerment true why true. is that what is the reason behind it um first of all uh, it's as i said um the technology must serve the humans right um so mm -hmm. technology must empower humanity and, and empower them and, and enhance or augment the the, the workers um, and and secondly, uh, we must create values. And uh, by creating values, um, you need the workers because AI will not replace the workers or the people in the shop floor, um, but they are getting digital augmented or empowered by such a technology. Um, Second, it's all about also about integration and acceptance, as I said. If it's easy mm -hmm. to use, if it's intuitive, um, like the first iPhone, right? It was intuitive. Everybody could use it. Even my mother now has an iPhone, right? And uh, uh, she's over 70. And uh, so people get accommodated with easy to use tools, even if they do not know how it works and what's behind. Um, so using Siri, for example. Um, so, and the third one is uh, the most important uh, topic for me is knowledge and knowledge preservation and um, empowerment of less skilled people. Um, mm -hmm. The first topic of knowledge preservation is um, very, very really critical for most of our clients because they do not get new young talents uh, onboarded as much as they need it. And even more, they see a knowledge drains by retiring experts in the next couple of years. So knowledge is, is being drained out of companies in a huge amount. Um, and that knowledge was, was, was collected over 30, 40 years. Now, what do you do if you do not have on one side, you do not have the talents that come to your company and, 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 and on board um, as much as you need? And on second, the knowledge get drained and and then lost um, because of retirement and 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 also changes in, in jobs. Um, so you need to preserve the knowledge inside um, your company, especially when you have such uh, very complex technologies and processes like in the casting, where you need many many years of experience um, to to actually maintain and 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 manage um, a casting process um, on on the expert level. Um, so technology um, is there to provide an answer on one hand to preserve knowledge, keep the knowledge into the company, but also function as an empowerment for less skilled workers because the lack of, of, of hiring or the, 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 the hiring problematic in every industry is leading to people who are less trained or less experienced. And that combination is... Um... I will jump in here. So when, when I talk with leaders of manufacturing companies, I oftentimes see that they have a specific roadmap for digitalization, for example, on the one side, and then have they have some other items which are connected to worker empowerment, how they want to empower their workers. And I oftentimes see it that the two directions are not connected. So for them, it's two topics, but they are not connected. What is your experience when you talk with leads, with customers? Do they already get the point which you mentioned that you need to connect it? Um, when we um, mentioned that in the discussions, yes, they will recognize it immediately. Um, they themselves have, um, due to the the... the the, the amount of challenges that they have to deal with, it's not obvious that most of the challenges are interconnected or also are um, belonging each other. For example, you need experts to optimize your cost structure or to optimize mm -hmm. your efficiency. Um, and then when you talk about experts and hiring and knowledge preservation, then, of course, it appears say, oh, well, 
my experts are lacking and uh, I do not get the talents as, as much as I need. And then, then they have a problem with, the, um, with uh, uh, in a few years when mm-hmm. my, my experts are, are retired. Um, so yes, you're right. Um, in most cases, it's not all, all times connected. But um, if you if you start this, this discussion and put let's say the open open lines together and the open items, then there's a red line appearing, and then they will recognize that they have to connect um, the empowerment of the workers with their actual initiatives of of, um, of Jürgen, savings. This order. is super interesting, and we could talk even uh, longer right now. But we are coming to the last question. So my question at the end is, assume you are the CIO of a manufacturing company. And this company is a little bit old fashioned. So there's not much digitalization happening in the shop floor. You have an ERP system, but nothing more. A lot of paper in the shop floor. And you want to start the transformation right now. You want to make it future proof. Which topic? do you put on the agenda right now? Um, so first of all, I would always start uh, with um, use case specific digitalization approaches. So I would mm-hmm. not start with a big bang and, 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 and for example, start with the whole digitalization topics or whatever. Look for pain points, look for use cases that are really pressuring um, in terms of costs, energy, efficiency, whatever. Um, and those, as, as, as I said, most of the cases are also linked to knowledge preservation. As I said, operations uh, topics that are linked to, to where do I keep my knowledge in-house and how? And when, when, what do I do when, when the people are leaving? Um, how much effort it, it takes to train new people? So um, coming from these pain points um, is, first of all, the best advice I can give from my perspective. Um, and then create a, a roadmap around those use cases and pain points um, that creates a red line. For example, also in terms of the digitalization on the shop floor, the machines um, that needs to connect it. Um, you should always go step by step with small use cases in order to provide an instant ROI. Because it does not make sense to create whole architecture and blueprint and whatever yeah. with a huge investments with a payback in, in five to 10 years. Um, um, I believe in quick re- returns. Um, I believe in, in, in use cases that are very sharp and solving a concrete problem because then you have also the support of the, of the employees and the shop, uh, the shop floor workers um, that would like to reduce that pain or get rid of that pain. Jürgen, it was a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Benjamin. It was a great pleasure for me. It was very interesting and a great honor to be here. Thank you. Bye.